This part of the lecture is going to be focusing just on phenotypic methods of diagnostics. And the things that we'll talk about here are going to include directly examining uh, microorganisms, uh, doing biochemical testing, looking at susceptibility to antibiotics, uh, and then also like how do they grow? What media do they grow on? What are you know the requirements for metabolism? So let's go ahead and dive into that. There are a few types of tests that can be done right away when a sample gets down to the microbiology lab. And these tend to include immediate examination, right? So taking and making a gram stain and looking at the sample right away to determine, first of all, if there's bacteria present. And secondly, if there are bacteria, are they gram positive? Are they gram negative? Maybe it's a fungus that we're seeing, but we would be able to, or a yeast, right? Uh, we would be able to see that uh, that would be an immediate thing that we could see in the microscope. Um, and so those are going to be, you know, like the most common type of immediate uh, examination would be doing that gram stain. An acid fast stain is another one that can be done immediately. Um, and this one is going to be that type of test would be looking for mycobacterium specifically uh, because that is the type of bacteria that an acid fast stain is used for. So typically when we're talking about immediate examination, we're talking about microscopy. When a sample comes from the floor uh, down to the microbiology lab and it goes through the first initial like immediate um, testing, there's going to be usually like a gram stain and then a culture order. So there's a few swabs probably in the sample or else it's a fluid and some of it gets taken for the gram stain. But then the rest of it goes into um, plating it onto different media. And so this is going to be examination, but it takes time for incubation. And so usually what will happen is plates will get set up and then they'll be looked at the following day. So we say 24 hours, but it could be anywhere. It depends on what time of the day it gets set up and then those plates get pulled out. But again, these are going to utilize special media. And every sample has a special set of media that are used for different sites. So when you're looking at a stool sample, you're going to use media that's going to, you know, really try to cut down on the normal flora that's present. Um, when you're looking at a respiratory sample, like a sputum sample, you're going to use media that is um, biochemically supportive of the growth of uh, bacteria that we typically see causing um, respiratory tract infections. A urinary tract infection is going to utilize a different set of media. And it all has to do with, first of all, being able to support the growth of the most likely pathogens in that part of the body, but then also um, being selective for those pathogens and then differentiating those pathogens from non-pathogens. And so we have um, both selective and we have differential media that can be utilized. And as a review, because we did cover this earlier, uh, selective media is going to be a type of media that will prevent the growth of some organisms while selecting for growth of another type. And so it encourages um, growth of only the type that people are most interested in for that area of the body. Where differential media is going to grow organisms uh, it can be both selective and differential, but it's um, going to be able to differentiate between biochemical properties of two different species or three different species. And so I have a picture here of McConkie agar as well as Banatol salt agar. Those are probably two of the most common uh, media that are both selective and differential. Biochemical testing is included in the phenotypic methods because Biochemical testing is going to be able to show you or help you visualize if an organism produces a certain enzyme, or usually it's an enzyme, some sort of protein, right? Uh, but that protein is directly reflecting the, you know, that's the phenotype of the genes that are in the cell. And so it is a phenotype when we're looking at the different proteins that an organism makes. 
Um, <clears throat> typically, like I said, they're enzymes, and we tend to use tests that look for the presence of the enzyme by having the substrate in the, the media or in the test itself. And then when the organism is incubated with that substrate, then a certain reaction is going to occur. And these reactions are made visible by including some sort of color indicator. Often this is a pH change. Um, and and if, it, if like an acid is produced, the color will change one direction. If a base is produced or becomes more um, basic, then a different color um, is visualized. And that can tell you what, um, if a certain enzyme is present. So usually what we see um, is that if a microbe is unable to make an enzyme, there's usually not going to be a color change of some sort. This is just typically. And then if an organism does make a certain enzyme, then there will be some sort of color change. Um, that's, that's just a kind of a blanket statement. Of course, there are exceptions, but that is most often how biochemical testing is done in the microbiology lab. So then imagine that you have all of these biochemical tests and, you know, immediate observations from the microscope. Um, you try to put those all together and then to figure out which organism you have. It can be kind of difficult if there's not some sort of plan in place or some sort of protocol that you follow. And we often have a protocol that we follow in the lab um, and it can be kind of described as a dichotomous key. So the whole idea behind a dichotomous key is that di means two, and you really are faced with two decisions or two options at every turning point. And so we start out at the beginning with the microscopy, and we see, oh, it is a coxy. So we're going to look and we're going to follow the coxy path, right? Now, is it gram positive or, if it's, or is it gram negative? If it's gram positive, then you're going to pick the gram positive flow chart and kind of follow that down. After you do the gram positive, then you can decide, okay, I'll do a catalase test. And then if it's positive, you keep going down the positive catalase flow chart. If it's negative, then you are going to probably be looking at a streptococcus. You can work your way down to usually the genus level. Um, sometimes you can get species level, but usually there's going to have to be some sort of genotypic method or serological method to support uh, a species level identification. But using a dichotomous key is a really great way to organize data organize results in a way that can give you an answer. Um, it's kind of a, a guided inquiry to get you through problem solving. We've probably used one of these in the past, maybe not with microbiology, but it is a very common technique used for um, following a procedure. Lots of times people don't think about antibiotic sensitivity and that being a phenotype, but it most definitely is, right? If a microorganism is resistant to an antimicrobial, like an antibiotic of some sort, that means that that microbe produces some protein that is able to either block the, the function of the antibiotic, or it can um, break apart that antibiotic, or, or in some way it prevents that bi antibiotic from doing or carrying out its mechanism of action. And that most definitely is going to be the result of the production of a protein, which we would call a phenotype. Um, antimicrobial sensitivity testing is absolutely vital with any microbial infection. Well, with some, most microbial infections. Some bacteria are just very susceptible to the drugs that we have. And so lots of times, like for a strep throat, you're probably not going to have sensitivity testing done on that group A strep. But if you're doing like a, uh, a urinary tract infection or a staph aureus infection, it is absolutely vital that sensitivity testing is done to make sure that the appropriate antibiotic can be used and at the appropriate concentration. Most times when an organism is growing up, it's automatically entered for susceptibility testing. So usually identification and susceptibility testing go hand in hand. And um, we see this as being so important because of the rise of antimicrobial drugs or, um, um, yeah, 
<laughs> resistant. Uh, there's a there's a antimicrobial resistant or drug resistant organisms, right? Where they are uh, resistant to a lot of the main antibiotics we use. Um, MRSA is a very commonly known and seen um, bacteria. It's a Staph aureus that is resistant to um, methicillin and any of the methicillin derivatives. Um, yeah, multi-drug resistant is what I was going for, MDRs. And so they are a very big concern. VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococci. Uh, there's a handful of these. Um, we're seeing a lot of tuberculosis that is uh, multi-drug resistant and it's very concerning. And so it's important that sens uh, sensitivity testing or susceptibility testing is done in order to um, decrease the chance of treating an organism and it not being effective. Phenotypic methods are pretty great. I mean, not only are they pretty fun, you know, to do microscopy and to grow up cultures and to look at biochemical tests, uh, but they're also pretty cheap and uh, they can provide a lot of information with very few resources. There are some drawbacks with phenotypic testing. First of all, um, it takes a long time, right? When we're doing um, growing up an organism, we're looking at 24 hours. Then we do susceptibility testing. That's another 24 hours. If you want to do identification in there, that could be an additional. So you could be a, a few days to a week into an infection before really knowing a lot of the, the information that you would need to fight it. So that is definitely a major drawback of phenotypic testing. Um, another thing to think about is that a lot of infections are actually caused by organisms that are very difficult to culture. And so it's hard to not only get the organism from the body to identify it and to do any type of testing, but um, it could potentially be that um, there's contamination and we would be running phenotypic tests on what we think is the pathogen, but it could actually be normal flora. So it is definitely um, a, a drawback at that, you know, in that case. Now, a, an experienced microbiologist um, is pretty good at determining what's normal flora and what would be a true pathogen. But even at that, it's, it's really hard to say sometimes and especially if the true pathogen isn't able to grow. So although phenotypic um, testing is still routinely done in labs all over the world, um, there are definitely some drawbacks that have led to um, the use of both serologic and molecular genetic methods um, to be uh, employed quite a bit. We'll look at those two in the next two uh, lectures.